Hello everyone, this video is about population ecology, which is chapter 53, or unit 1, standard 3. Um, at the end of this PowerPoint, you should be able to know or understand um, what density, dispersion, and demographics, um, what those terms mean when we're describing populations. You should also know the difference between exponential and logistic, and then also know the difference um, and give examples of density-dependent factors and density-independent factors and how, how they're used to control population growth. So first of all, population, if you're wondering what that means, it's a group of individuals of a single species living in the same general area. So like a whole bunch of dogs, a whole bunch of humans, um, just the same species and a whole bunch of them all in the same area. Density, you may have heard something being very dense, means there's a lot of, um, in a given area, how many of those individuals are there. So something that's high density means there's tons of it in one small space. Uh, low density means there's not that many individuals in a small space. And dispersion is the pattern of spacing between individuals. So how the individuals in a population are um, spread out, they call that dispersion. So how do, you, how do you determine size and density? Like how do you, what do you do? Well, the easiest, well, the hardest way, but the simplest way to, to do it is just count. Just go one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I wanted to count this random population right here, I could just literally go one, two, three, four, whatever. Um, you can also do random sampling. So what random sampling does is, um, you may have seen this in political um, polls as well, that if like in this area there's about 10 and then there's like, you know, five different squares of 10, or I can guesstimate five um, squares of 10, there's probably about 50 here. So random sampling. And then mark and recapture, um, you, they mostly do this for aquatic animals, is where they give them a like a mark or a, a tag, and depending on how many come back, you can kind of guess um, how many population, how, how much the population is. So that's how you determine size. How about dispersion? Here's the three different patterns of dispersion. First one is clumped. So it's the most common and they're usually clumped by um, some sort of resource that you want. So here's a, a clumped example. These are sea stars in a, in, a tide, in a tide pool and they're usually clumped like so. There's also uniform. So in uniform um, they're kind of like equally spaced, uh, usually antagonistic interactions. So um, these are usually interactions between species that you know can't really be close to each other. So look at these penguins; they're all kind of equally uniform. And the last one is random. Random is not very common. There's usually a reason for why something is. But for example, um, I guess this is like flowers or grass. Um, there's no real pattern that you can see. So clumped, random, and um, uniform. Um, demography, so this is another thing we're going to study, is like the demographics of a population. So it's the study of vital statistics that affect population size. Okay, So this part's very simple or very easy to understand. Additions come from birth. Okay, So the population, um, you add to a population by birth and you subtract through death. Okay, One of these things that we use to organize this kind of stuff is called a life table. I'm going to show you an example. And a life table is an age-specific summary of the survival pattern of a population. And then they use this data with a survivorship curve, which I'll also show you an example of. And they plot the number of individuals in a cohort still alive at each age. So let me show you what these look like. So here's the life table I was talking about. So a life table um, from 0 to 1. Let's just go across. So I have females and males. From age 0 to 1, I can see the number alive at the start of the year, the proportion alive at the start of the year, number of deaths, the death rate, um, and then I can calculate life expectancy, etc. So this is like a life table. It's very simple. This is for um, squirrels. All they do really is just count the number alive at each year, um, the proportion alive compared to the following year. So they're just trying to see like how many um, live at the end of each year. From that data, they can make something called a survival ship curve. Um, I think the bottom is cut off. Let me see if I could get a little bit of it. So here's a survivorship curve. Basically, a curve. Um, it's in a, It's on. This graph is a logarithmic scale. So you can see it's one, ten, a hundred, a thousand. Oops, sorry. One, ten, a hundred, a thousand. So this is what they do. So at um, at different intervals, they see how many survivals um, last over how many years. So think for us humans. This is called a type one curve. So from zero to let's just say sixty like almost a thousand of the survivors are still alive at age 60. By the time you get to 100, we're all dead. I know. Um, this is a, um, another type of animal like squirrels. Um, they kind of decline in population kind of evenly. So at, um, at zero, they're all alive. At 50, half of them are gone. And at 100, they're all gone. So it's a nice straight line. 
constant death over the lifespan. And the last one, these are oysters. Um, they have a high death rate. So at a thousand or at zero, they have all of them. But within you know five, ten years, they're almost pretty much all gone. Oysters have a very short lifespan. So you should know, be able to identify the three survivorship curves: type one, type two, and type three. Um, another thing we can talk about is life history. It's the traits that affect an organism's schedule of reproduction and survival. So we talked about this being fitness, um, reproduction, and the ability to survive. So here are the three variables. The age of sexual maturation, so at what age can your species reproduce, how often it reproduces, and how much offspring do they have during each event. These traits are evolutionary outcomes, not conscious decisions by organisms. So depending on the organism, they pick um, the type of one of the three variables, okay? So the evolutionary outcomes, a, a species, a human doesn't decide, oh, I'm gonna sexually mature later or earlier. This is all stuff that happens as a result of evolution. So one of the things that they could be is called semilparis or semilparity. Semilparity means a big bang reproduction, which means at one time, a species produces many offspring. You should know some like ants or cockroaches, mostly insects, that have offspring all at once and a whole bunch of them, like hundreds of them. The individual often dies afterwards. So think of like a fly, again, or an insect. Like they don't, their lifespan is very short and they live in very unstable environments. The opposite of that is iteroparis or iteroparity, where they have repeated reproduction, but they have very, very few offspring and they're very large. And these ones are usually in more stable environments. So take, for example, a lizard. They have um, not as many offspring as flies or roaches or ants, um, but they are very large. The critical factors are um, survival rate of offspring and repeated reproduction when resources are limited. So, <coughs> sorry. So these ones, the survival rate is very high and they repeat um, reproduction when resources are limited. Another formula that you need to know is called the change in population size formula. So how do, can you uh, put a number to how population size? It's very simple. The change in population size, so change in population size over change in time, that's what these deltas mean, is equal to births minus deaths. That's very simple, right? So zero population growth. So how can somebody have some zero population growth? That means the number of births is equal to the number of deaths. That makes sense, right? If the amount of people um, being born is equal to the amount of people dying, then you have zero population growth. Another type of exponential growth is called exponential. So you get exponential population growth when your species is in ideal conditions and the population grows really quickly. So for example, this blue one, okay, the change in, remember my n, if I go back, oops, if I go back, n stands for population size. So if my population size has a, a one factor, Look how fast this curve grows up from zero to 2,000. And within um, almost five generations, it starts to peak really fast. If that factor was 0.5, like just half of what, I, it's my exponential growth goes a little bit slower, but still picks up very fast later on. So in ideal conditions, you get exponential um, population growth. And here's an example of exponential population growth. Here are elephants. Um, if they have ideal conditions, no one hunting them, um, they have enough food, so here we go, 1900, 1910, 1920, barely anything. And as we get to 1960, these populations, these elephants grow extremely fast. So think about it this way, like elephants, they have two kids, and then their kids have two kids, and those two kids have two kids. So it grows really, really fast. Um, this is an example of an exponential curve. The only problem is that ex unlimited resources are rare. So no one really goes through exponential growth, or it goes through exponential growth and it stops at some point. This is called the logistic model, which is called basically the exponential model, but including something called carrying capacity, which they use the variable K. K is the maximum population which can be sustained by the environment. So for example, ooh, sorry. For example, take my exponential curve that we just talked about in the last slide. So here it is, okay? But what if your environment, whether it's because it's small or there's not enough food, what if the carrying capacity is 1500? This is what the new graph would look like. As I get to kind of halfway through to the uh, carrying capacity, it starts to tail off and go towards um, this imaginary dotted line. Or, you, or if you studied in math, this is called an asymptote. So it goes, it goes, it goes, exponential growth, exponential growth. And as I get closer to the carrying capacity, it goes like this. That's why they call exponential growth a J curve. It looks like a J. And they call logistic growth an S curve. 
in logistic growth, remember my exponential growth formula? This is my logistic growth formula. It's R max times K minus N, carrying capacity minus the number of populations over the carrying capacity. Okay? And again, it's called it's an S-shaped curve. And we'll see some examples of this later on in class. This is what you see. Um, I know it's hard to chart, uh, like you know, animals like elephants and humans. So what they do is like you know, lab populations they grow really quickly, so you can see how they grow. So here is an example of a paramecium, which you may have heard before, and this is a daphnia, another uh, microorganism. And you can see um, how this particular one is slow, slow, slow. It rises really fast, and then it drops because there's not that much population. Uh, there's not enough stuff to sustain that population. Same thing with the paramecium. It grows, 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 grows really fast and all of a sudden it just tails off and stops. Both are S curves. So here are the factors that limit population growth. So why would a population not grow um, unlimited or infinitely? There's density dependence. Oops. I know you can tell me it keeps doing that. Um, density dependence, which is population matter. So these are factors in which um, growth is limited because of the density of a population. So we're talking about predation, disease, competition, territoriality, waste accumulation, physiological factors. So these are the density dependent factors. These are things that depending on how dense your population is, um, that these factors are much, much worse or much or very, very weak. These ones are density independent, where population is not a factor. So it's actually easier to remember the density independent factors because they're all basically natural disasters. Fire, flood, tornadoes, weather. We're basically talking about, I don't care how big your population is, how dense it is, um, natural disasters will affect it no matter what. These ones, your, dense, your population has to be dense for it to really matter. I think these are the, um, these are the last ones we're talking about. Um, K selection and R selection. This is very similar to... Um, the semi Paris and iteral Paris we were talking about earlier. So these type, these are uh, descriptions of a type of species. K selection. Um, these are populations close to carry capacity, and R selection are those that maximize reproductive success. So those are the ones that maximize making babies. So K selection. This is like us humans. We live around the carry capacity. We have high prenatal care. So we we take care of our babies very well. We have very low birth numbers, but our young can survive very well. We're density dependent, such like us, humans. Our selection is thinking of the opposite. So instead of being around the carrying capacity, it grows exponentially. They very, 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 very um, have they have very little care of their little of their young because they have very, very high birth numbers, which means their their young um, have very poor survival rates. It's density independent, and uh, uh, the best example of this are cockroaches. They also fluctuate due to biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic is living factors and abiotic is non-living factors. So think of biotic as like food and stuff like that. Abiotic, um, think about the environment. So here um, is an example of um, two species, wolves and moose. So you kind of see how these kind of go back and forth, right? So here the wolves are high, moose are low. Then the moose go low, sorry, then the wolves go low and moose go high. Then moose go low, wolves high. You can see how these alternate, right? So back and forth. If wolves are high, moose are low. If moose are high, wolves are low. So here's another example, hare and lynx. So look at this. When the hare is high, all of a sudden it drops and then the lynx is high. And when the lynx is high, um, then it drops and then the hare is high. You might be wondering why, is this t why does this happen? This is called a boom and bust cycle. This always happens with predator and prey interactions. So basically what happens is because this lynx hunts hares or rabbits or bunnies. Um, take this for example. At this point in this year, there's so many hares. Because there's so many hares, that means there's tons of food for lynx, so they survive. But since there's so much lynx, all of a sudden the population of hare decreases. Because that decreases, there's no more food, so now the lynx die. Because the lynx die, now the hare can live and grow and make more of them. And since there's more of them, then the lynx come back. And that's what you call a boom and bust cycle. Um, it's usually between predators and preys, and that's a, a pattern that you should know for populations. And the last thing we're going to talk about is human population growth, so just focusing just on humans. Um, there's two configurations for stable human population growth. So there's only two ways that a population can be stable for humans. It's either high birth and high death, or low birth and low death. And this is called, and I'll show you a, a chart later, but this is called the demographic transition. 
And this definition is not very good, but I'll explain later. One way you could chart human population growth, they don't use this for anything else other than human, it's called age structure diagrams. So how to read an age structure diagram is on the side there's an age, um, I think they're in groups of five, and what percent of the population is in that age range. So say for example, take Afghanistan. This is uh, an example of a rapid growth. So you should know a rapid growth age structure looks like a pyramid. If you get something like this, you know your population is going to grow exponentially. So look at this, almost 9% of the population, um, male and female, are younger than 4, which means there's very little old people. There's very little old people and there's so much young, which means that um, in this population, especially in Afghanistan, it doesn't have the medical or the, the health care that allows old people to live very long. So why? what does something else look like? Well, thinking about the United States. This is the United States where we have slow growth. Here, you see it's more, um, more rounded than this pyramid. So if you look across, other than the 80s, these look kind of very similar, like in, similar in, in width. It's almost like Italy. Italy has, um, it's not perfect, but this is almost a good rectangle, which means there's no growth because every single um, age has, um, has about the same. If you get an inverted pyramid, like say this is up, up here, like very wide, and here it's very small, that's telling me that your population is declining and it's about to die. The global carrying capacity, they're saying that in the world, um, probably our carrying capacity is between 7 to 10 Point eight billion people, or sorry, we're saying that there's seven to take. There's going to be seven point eight to ten point eight billion people by the year 2050. Um, last year, if you heard, we broke the seven billion barrier. We're growing exponentially, and we're trying to guess that maybe Earth only has a ten to fifteen billion dollar carrying capacity. Um, how can they predict that? So they use something called an eco footprint or ecological footprint. So they're talking about how much land and water, how much area do you need to live? That's called the ecological footprint. Um, you may not know this, but the United States, so 1.7 hectares, it's, a, it's, a, it's similar to acres. So usually a person needs 1.7 acres per person. The only problem is that in the United States, think of, this as think of this as crazy, but the average acreage that we kind of need, how many hectares we need per person in the US is 10. We use so much electricity, food, water. It's 10 times more than the rest of the world. It's just crazy. And if everybody lived like us, we'd be way over the carrying capacity. So that's one of the things we try to fix. Like, how do you fix that? How do you, what are the solutions? That's one of the things that will like doom us forever. So here's an example of a nice pretty chart about what ecological footprint is. So basically, um, there's only this much types of, um, Remember, uh, Mr. Xu talked about biomes. So here's the different types of biomes, like habitat land, built land, bioproductive land, bioproductive sea, energy land. So don't worry about this so much. But here's an, a, a great example of what is the footprint of different countries of the world. So you see how the United States is so big and so fat right here? Um, it has a very big footprint. But same thing with China and India. You probably are wondering, why does China and India have such a big footprint? Well, think of it this way. Even though they don't use as many resources as us, they have billions more, not billions more, but a billion people in China and a billion people in India alone. So if they, they have a very large footprint. Look how big Japan is. Normally Japan's very small. And then here's like here's where it shrinks. Like you look at Africa, look at South America. Even though there's a lot of people there, they barely use anything. So their footprint is very tiny. So hopefully you learned a lot about populations and population, you know, all the vocab that goes with populations. If you have any questions, you can see, you can see me or Mr. Xi. And um, we'll talk about it. Hopefully you understand populations very well. Thank you and thanks for watching.